Hey gang, Professor McElroy here. It's uh, 630, so let's get started here with uh, uh, week two, uh, digital animation and effects one. Uh, we're navigating through uh, Adobe Animate. Uh, this week is all about uh, covering things like symbols, uh, tweening, uh, motion guides, some basic action scripting in order to control how the user navigates through our animation. Uh, this course is, this, uh, this lecture really kind of hopefully continues to connect the dots with the idea of frames, keyframes, and long sequence navigation. So uh, hopefully, and many of you have, have uh, read and started the process of the first few chapters in our Adobe Animate textbook. Uh, and so we're gonna continue teaching the skills that kind of spoons feeds us through chapter three, four, five, and six. So last week we kind of learned about basic uh, timeline animation and keyframe by keyframe, uh, how to import uh, graphics, specifically vector-based uh, elements, and how we started to build a sequential animation at 30 frames per second. So we're gonna continue to kind of reinforce that process and kind of get into some more of the I wouldn't say advanced, but basic intermediate skills as it pertains to animate and how to navigate through uh, an SWF file or an HTML5 exported file uh, that we can embed in the web uh, as we need to. So uh, good job so far. Good job with student introductions. Good job with the first discussion topic post and good job starting uh, the reading and submitting of the first couple of projects chapter assignments inside your textbook. Now, I made a new announcement in the announcement section where I attached a zip file for all of the entire book chapter student source files. Uh, the book kind of does it differently in the introduction than it has done in the last few editions. Uh, we used to go to peachpit.com slash register and we would uh, type in our USBN uh, or ISBN number, and uh, we would catalog our book and it would clarify it and it would give us access to the lesson files. Now it has us going through a different website and has us answering a question that's embedded in one of the chapters that you can actually have access to by opening up your book on your digital uh, uh, bookshelf. And so it's kind of a new process. Some students have the 2020 edition because they've had other coursework. Uh, some have the 2021 edition. So just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, uh, the editions as they update sometimes swap chapters. So even though it teaches the same chapter three and chapter four, sometimes it swaps it and four becomes three and three becomes four. So just to not micro the chapter zip files, I put an entire zip file for all of your chapter assignments uh, posted in our announcement section. So you can download it there. It is 365 meg, so it's enormous. And so just give yourself a little time to download it if you haven't downloaded the files already and you'll have all of the animate files that you need for the chapter assignments. As we start to go into chapter three, four, five, six, we're gonna start going into those skills that we're gonna to touch on tonight, keeping in mind that there's lots of ways to do lots of things in the Adobe CC applications. So I'm gonna show you, spoon feed you first, what animate is, which was week one, and week two, getting into symbols, tweening, motion, action scripting, and some audio importing, because those are the, the skills, the skill set that you're going to be using kind of as you explore the software application, more than likely at the professional level. Your book does a really great job of adding additional granular skills, but as long as we know how to drill down, know how to look for, and know how to navigate through the application, I think we'll be much better off as it relates to uh, Adobe Animate and 2D animation and multimedia animation, which is what we're doing here. So if you haven't downloaded the chapter files, you can go to the announcement link here and you can download the 350 megabyte zip file. Just know that when you unzip it, it's all of the chapter assignments and all of the student files as they relate to the chapter assignments. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, I did put a zip file out there uh, for you guys for tonight's lecture. So I'm actually gonna download this thing because I haven't put it on the teacher station either. 
We're gonna take a look at a file that I started constructing, kind of using the best practices of what I do uh, using Adobe Animate professionally. And then we're gonna reconstruct it kind of from ground zero. So we can talk about what symbols are, what tweening is or animation is, uh, onion skinning, kind of that process of filling in the blanks between keyframe one and then keyframe like frame 45 or 60 or whatever, what that thing looks like and talk about scripting and how you can control how the user interacts with this multimedia export file that we export. So I'm gonna go ahead and unzip that file. I put in the announcement section uh, and we're going to start to navigate a little bit through animate, learn about symbols, learn about uh, timeline behaviors, onion skinning, tweening, uh, a little action scripting and get into the multimedia interactive component of Adobe Animate. So uh, everyone should have that file downloaded in the announcement section and then we're gonna start our lecture. So let me go ahead and minimize my screen. Uh, we're in lecture series files for lecture two. We're gonna do some action scripting. We're gonna do, do some symbol creating. We're gonna import audio files. Uh, we're gonna be doing some onion skinning and tweening and we're gonna do motion guides just to kind of take that next step. We gotta spoon feed the process. So we have to start with those granular skills last week, keyframe by keyframe, base timeline animation, importing vector graphics, the basic process of how to construct an animate file. Now we're gonna take it that one step further, create symbols, attach behaviors, uh, give them instance names, all the things that start building up uh, of those kind of granular skills. So each week we try to touch the element of uh, the process, the creative process, what we do professionally to use Adobe Animate. Uh, so I'm just gonna make a folder, digital animation, I'm gonna dump my animation week one folder in there uh, and I'll add my last name because it really is best practice to make sure that you also add your last name or the client name if it's a sp specific client that you're working on. That's kind of how I folder my process. I name the client. So then if I ever have to search my computer, I can always find what I'm looking for. So inside my animation macroy folder, you're gonna see lecture one and now lecture two, which has all of the files for our lecture uh, that we're going to be constructing tonight. We're gonna kind of deconstruct it. So we're gonna build it from scratch, but I wanted to throw a few files together, uh, a few elements together in a file so that we're kind of on that same kind of wavelength is where we're going and kind of where we're gonna build from so you can kind of see the process. So everyone download that Animate Lecture 2 file, make sure you have it on your desktop. You'll also notice that I converted the EPS files to Illustrator files for ease of import versus a Mac versus PC environment. EPS files are fine. They interact really well with the Mac environment, but we noticed last week that the uh, Windows environment does not like the EPS files imported into Animate as much, which is kind of ironic because the dashboard is exactly the same on PCs and Macs. So the fact that it didn't like a certain file over another is kind of the evolution of the software. I guess having a creative cloud, which means it updates itself whenever it wants to, sometimes it gets ahead of itself. And so sometimes things interact a little bit differently from like the beginning of the semester when we did our update to any of the updates that happen in the meantime. So just know that we only update our Adobe CC at the beginning of each session, which means if an update runs week two or week three and more bells and whistles are added, anything happens, it doesn't happen on my end until September 1st when the next session starts. So it becomes a bit of a tricky kind of hill, um, but the beauty is you can always export an SWF file. Uh, and so that really is a good exported file out of uh, Adobe Animate. So I can open it up easily in Canvas. Now, as far as submitting files go, uh, most students have had a session before or at least one at Hodges before, but some have not. Know that you just need to click on your chapter assignment link inside your learning module. So for chapter one, you click on chapter one and you hit the submit button. Now you can give me the FLA file, just know that that's a lot larger than the SWF file. You can see it right here. 
11 megs versus 600K, total difference, depending on your speed of your internet connection, depends on how easily you share files with me when we swap things back and forth. So just know an SWF file is fine. I will always in any class that I teach for you will give you the export file that is acceptable for ease of upload so that we not only reach the outcomes we need to, but you give a file that's easy to swap. Sometimes I have the uh, video class and they're trying to give me this huge premiere file and it crashes at the end of the night after they leave their computer on for two hours. And I'm like, you could have just exported to MP4 if you watched my recording or you watched the lecture or you came in or you sent an email to make it a lot easier for you. An MP4 file is way easier to upload than a Premiere file or an Animate file or anything like that. So in most cases in the graphic design classes, uh, an export file is easier than the source file, a PSD, an AI, an FLA file. Any of those like native source files are much larger and involve in sometimes linked images than it is just to give me an export file. So I'll try to always give you a professional export file so you're comfortable with what you would give a client, what you would give someone that's producing something for you so that you have the best output possible uh, for that solution. So that's it for my kind of rant. Let's go in now to week two. Yeah, on the announcement section, there is a le lecture two student files. The, yeah, I did a zip of all the chapter files. Yeah, the chapters sometimes get swapped in new editions. So like four becomes three and three becomes four. So now you have, it's mostly in order, but there are a couple of chapters that they have swapped. On this attached zip file. Yeah, that was, oh. yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So just know now that the introduction to your book will allow you to download everything in one swoop, kind of, that's the way Adobe works. If I can give you the whole zip file, I give it to you, but this one's 350 meg, the one for Animation 2 class is six gigs, so I can't upload that one to Canvas, six gigs, it's all videos, so it's like 300 meg videos one at a time, like it's enormous. Uh, so if I can, I can, but just know the introduction to the book does have the website you go to, you enter in your ISBN number, and then it'll ask you for a word in a chapter, like chapter three, paragraph two, what's the fourth word? And you just open up your digital book and you go to chapter three, paragraph four, fourth word, and you type it in, it's playhead or something like that, I think is the question they asked for this one. And it gives you the, the full batch of source files. So if I can, I will. I can't always do it because the files are just enormous. So just go into the announcement, download the lecture two, uh, and we're gonna go in. It's gonna look like this. It's animate lecture two zip files. So just unzip it. And we're gonna take a look at some attributes, some animations, how things work. And then we're gonna build something from scratch. But I just gave you the files versus navigating for the will files. Will this one actually be out of the project? So I thought, that's what you did. I thought that's what you did in class. That's why I was so confused when I emailed you. Because that's what you usually would do. You'd like start it so we could like figure yes. out. Yes. It's a combo okay. because some students prefer just to do keyframe by keyframe because it's simple 800 by 600 mm -hmm. response. And you actually see I posted a student project already. And so the that. little Mario guy that runs and hits the mm -hmm. square and the little stars go up, he did that keyframe by keyframe. So lecture two is tweening and motion guides. So it didn't so, have to be a sport. Well, he wasn't a sports guy. So he emailed and asked if it didn't have to be a sport. And I said, it's okay if you wanna do something that isn't sport, as long as it shows the process we're teaching. So if you're not a lover of sports and you wanna do something more, in this case, it was video game oriented, I'm, I'm okay with that. So just reach out first. So I know what you're doing before it pops into the book thing. And I'm like, Oh, what is this thing? So yeah, he didn't love sports, so he wanted to do that. So I think he did a good job too. So uh, awesome. as long as the we can reflect the outcomes for the project, I'm okay if you stir off a little bit. Uh, so this is a combo. So in essence, this is our out of book chapter, out of book two, but some students like to wait so they can see the onion skinning and the connecting of animations and they end up doing the out of book one using this skill. So what whatever's the best practice for you. 
um, going forward. I try to combine the first two lectures just so that we cover as much as we can so that we can kind of stack skills. So it's hard because in two and a half hours, three hours, you can only get so many things, especially when it's an introductory, you have to introduce the software and that takes a lot of time. So, okay. All right, so everyone should have downloaded uh, the FLA file. So let's just open it up. So we're just gonna open it up and animate. This is a little animation I built uh, yesterday just to kind of talk about a few things. Uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of things actually, but um, so I'm gonna scroll down here. I'm just gonna test the movie. Uh, turn your audio down because I did embed a wave file. I put some sounds and stuff in this uh, so you can kind of see what's going on because we're going to talk about a few different things in this animation because they're all things we're going to cover tonight. So you're going to notice it's vector based. It's kind of a mountain ocean scene. There's a hot air balloon. There's a play button, which you can see when you move your mouse to the play button. And then the balloon floats, change perspective. <clears throat> pans to the right hand side, you hit replay, it go, goes back and does the same thing. There's a lot of things happening here. Uh, one thing is we have a use of every symbol that is available in Animate. So the background is a graphic symbol, the balloon is a movie symbol, and obviously the two text blocks are button symbols, which means they have instances inside of themselves. And we're gonna talk about that as we build an animation tonight, kind of how it works. Those symbols have instances. And when, the, when you define the graphic as a type of symbol with an instance, you can apply action scripting to it, which is what was done here. So most web banners, multimedia animations that you see out on the web, the dashboards that you see when you go to restaurants, hotels where you have a kiosk and it's a touch screen and it takes you through content. Many of it was developed in an environment like this where there is a wireframe, there's a set of symbols, the symbols have actions associated with them. In this case, it's action script and you can control the viewer and the behavior. So I've had this weird thing ever since I started doing the uh, chapter assignments mm -hmm. that I don't know why it's doing it. And I, I only make the pixels inside it. Like, can I show you? Uh -huh. <clears throat> you want me to come over? It's really weird, I'm sorry. That's okay. Cause like, I don't know how to like see this, like say I press that. Display. It does that because it only is highlighted this one part, so I have to drag the entire thing across, but I never had that before. That's because in and the latest update, something. there's a playhead command, which is what you have highlighted. That's just a playhead command telling it to play a certain section. Oh, can I like so get that rid was, of it? That was the latest update, and the reason they did that is because when you add audio, it plays itself over and over again, so by controlling the playhead, it doesn't run the audio. So. Just know it. that you have to highlight the play. Okay, because I didn't know if I like click something. You didn't. Okay, no. Know. And okay. it's good because the software is evolving, mm -hmm. which is making it easier for the user. The trick is sometimes, and like I said in the beginning of the lecture, it's hard to keep up with some of the constant evolution of it, the CC aspect of it where it's updating. So it runs an update in sleep mode. So yours ran an update that added the playhead command, which has that highlighted. Um, what we can try is if you go into, uh, let's see here, workspace and go to essentials. So you see window workspace essentials, mm -hmm. you may be able to strip it back to the pre playhead like just clicking reset? Yeah, you could just go to essentials. So workspace essentials. So is your set to essentials? Hmm. So click reset essentials. It may be a new part of the essentials palette that they added to the application, which is fine. You just have to know that you have to highlight the frame length in order to do it. Um, which does stink because that is an extra step. But I know because like when I did, I thought I was going crazy. I'm like, did I like delete half my animation? Mm -hmm. It's only showing me this one thing. Mm -hmm. But then I found out it's okay now. But yeah, it's like a microcosm setting so that you can set a certain frame length in order to tweak any animations happen there, which is great because Premiere has it too. You can actually highlight a section of video after you splice a bunch of video, and it will only loop back and forth in that video. So you can do your minor adjustments you need in there. Mm -hmm. So it's the idea of this kinetic big window with little clips inside the window. So just know that, yeah, you just have to drag the highlighter there. The resetting the essentials still kept the playhead there. Yeah. The advanced it doesn't playhead. really bother me. It's just, I just want to know if I click something. Yeah. All right, so, all right, so 
we have a lot of things going on here inside of this movie. And so we're gonna need to reconstruct this animation so we can go over the process of setting up symbols, uh, creating a motion, uh, adding a guide to the motion, understanding the properties of the objects, how to attach an instance and action scripting to the object and take us from just a simple frame by frame thing to now something that has an involved animation that includes a language embedded in the animation to control how the user does this thing. Okay, so that's what we're building upon. So I put all the assets in there so we can go through the process of how these things happen. All right, so we can go ahead and close this FLA. Let's go in and create a new. We're gonna go with the standard. So HD is fine, presets 1280 by 720. 30 frame rate is fine. Action skipping three is good because we're gonna use code snippets in either to populate the behaviors in our instances and our symbols. So let's keep everything as the default, HD 1280 by 720, 30 frame rate, action scripting. Just remember from last week, anything from 24 frames to 30 frames, your eye can't tell the difference. So it animates seamlessly as long as we do it right. Uh, anything past 24 frames. 30 frames have been bumped up because it's the high definition setting. We went from 800 to, by 600 to 1280 by 720. You'll actually notice that I keep the video smaller for you and you're out of book. So I keep them 800 by 600 uh, just for the fact that we'll compress its file a little bit. So we'll go ahead and create. All right, so here we are. So let's zoom out a little bit. I'm just gonna zoom out so I can see the entire artboard. So there it is, I'm at 25% over here. We're in scene number one. We're gonna an animate everything inside one single scene, but we're gonna show you where you drill into to find elements that you need to find when you're editing something that already exists, AKA your textbook. They give you a file in many instances that has behaviors and settings and code and everything embedded in the file. So now we're gonna explore where that stuff is, how you interact with it and what it looks like. If you have any experience in web design whatsoever, it does help you ever so slightly in action scripting because action scripting is based on tags and IDs. And when you've seen those before, it makes it a little bit easier, but action script code snippets have behaviors and descriptions embedded in them. So it makes life a little bit easier. Okay, so first things first, we're gonna go in and we're gonna import our background. So we're gonna import our background. Remember, I already saved this as an AI file to make it a little bit easier for you. So we're gonna go file import to the stage, which means we're just gonna stick it right here at keyframe number one, layer number one. Let's go to our desktop. Let's go to our folder, uh, animation lecture two. Uh, and you're going to see mountains, and mountains is what we're importing in. And it's fine to import everything in grouped. So I'm just going to hit enter. And there is my file. Remember, it's an AI file or an illustrator file, so it's vector based. So we can scale it as big as we want. We need to fill our document here. Remember, this is a white artboard, but we want to make sure that we fill the entire border and don't push it where it just barely makes it. Like let's hold down shift and make this thing pretty big. And remember that center dot is the waist. So we wanna make sure that we don't touch that waist when we scale this up because this little dot right here, this little anchor point or waist or center point of your bounding box becomes a really important element when we move into the bone tool and skeleton motion next week. So this thing can be moved, which means your pivot point in your bounding box can be moved, but we're gonna see what happens with that next week for our lecture. So let's scale it up, make sure it fills the artboard or canvas and have it fill to the edge. Make sure you go a little off the edge, which is called a bleed because we don't wanna make, students always scale it where they make it to the very edge and then they publish their video and there's a white border around their document, which they didn't realize because it's really hard to see whether something is completely on the edge or not. So just give it a little wiggle room. Once you scale it up, go ahead and deselect it, which means just go back to your selection arrow and click out here in your pasteboard somewhere. Remember when nothing is selected, the properties window over here becomes your, your video settings. So like our artboard is white, which they call the stage. Uh, our frame rate is 30. These are our pixel dimensions without anything selected. It's just the movie settings or animation settings of the document you're working in. So 
the first thing we have to do is name our layer. So I'm going to kind of quickly continue from one lecture one into lecture two. Uh, so let's rename this layer uh, mountains underscore BG. I like to name the properties of the object in the layers if I'm doing something specific. So I use like BG for background. Uh, it's not a necessity, but over the years of just using the software, uh, it's become easier for me. If I ever have to do an edit find, I type in BG and it finds all my background elements for me. So just the best practice when you're collecting files, organizing files and naming things in your file, try to find something that's comfortable for you. So if it's a background element, uh, back GR, uh, BG, whatever that process is for you, because it's important, the quicker you can find something, the quicker you can work. So file management is a really important process. I've used a lot of file management software over the years, and it's only as good as the name you associate with your files. So if you're just randomly picking things or downloading things, and it's like Pexels 0586, blah, 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 you're never going to remember that file. But if you download a runner, and you name it runner or pexels runner or something with the subject matter and it's a lot easier to search and find. I spend more times with my clients finding files they need me to edit than I do actually editing the files. And remember time is money. So just get comfortable with BG as a background. Um, name, naming your layers like that when you're in Photoshop, just naming them things that you can track down. Okay, uh, so we're gonna do, uh, so we have mountains. Uh, we need to first, so the way animate works, it works in a three symbol environment. So you have three options for symbols. The first symbol is a graphic, which means it's just a locked grouped, quotation marks, grouped image. The reason creating symbols in animate is important is because action script and behaviors are attached to instances. Instances are names associated with symbols. So it's important for us to create symbols so that we can then associate behaviors with the symbols. Now, I 99% of the time do not use the term graphic or use the symbol graphic because I always want the option to embed actions inside of the symbol that I'm using. But for the sake of the lecture, we're gonna name this as a graphic symbol so that it's the first of the three symbols we're going to be exploring. But if I was doing this professionally, I would make this a movie because I could then drift the clouds, I could shimmy the waves, I could pan the mountains a little bit, which means kind of move them back and forth as if the water was rocking. The graphic symbol freezes this as a grouped object. So that's the only difference. But for the sake of learning the three symbols, we're gonna do that. So. Let's go in. I like to right click. We talked about it last week. We can do modify, create, or convert to symbol. Uh, I right click 99% of the time in any of the software app applications I use in Adobe because they got a team of hundreds of designers that are embedding behaviors into objects in their software based on what everyone does with it mostly as a tool. So right-clicking timelines, right-clicking graphics, right-clicking the pasteboard. It doesn't matter what software you're in in Adobe. If you right-click, it's going to be the common behaviors associated with the object that you're right-clicking. So let's convert to symbol. And you're going to notice this little window pops up. And the window, in essence, says, OK, what are you creating? Now, best practice, doesn't matter what application you're using in Adobe, don't use spaces. Get out of your brain writing things like mountain space tops or mountain end ocean. Because in our field, design, visual communication, whatever commercial art, whatever term you want to use, digital design, now so much is attached to behaviors. So even when you're using Photoshop, you can now animate in Photoshop. If you're using Illustrator, you can animate, you can make multimedia solutions in Illustrator. Spaces are percent 20 symbols inside of code world, language world. Well, we don't want percent 20s because percent 20s can cause errors when you go cross browser or cross device. So we just wanna make sure we don't do that. So let's do uh, mountain. So I'm just going to do mountain because I did mountain underscore BG with my layer name. So I'm just going to name the object what it is. Now, you're going to notice we have the option of creating three different types of symbols. 
graphic button and movie clip. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Graphic is a static image, a grouped object. So when we imported from Illustrator, it said, do you want to keep the object grouped? Yeah, sure. So do I necessarily have to make a group object a symbol? No. We created last week, we made no symbols whatsoever. We animated for a few seconds and we made a correct solution, a possible solution. The reason you generate symbols is because it's cross-platform, which means Illustrator has symbols, Photoshop has symbols, applications have symbols in Adobe CC. So you can actually import and export symbols across multiple applications. So if I create a symbol for the balloons, I can actually import that symbol into Illustrator, which is good. It also allows us to attach a scripting language or a behavior to our graphic. So it's fine to not do that if you're doing keyframe by keyframe, but just know that the interactivity of the elements we're trying to create requires instances and instances require symbols being created. So we're gonna name a mountain. We're going to make it a graphic, the very basic root of what we're doing here. And we're gonna click, okay, so you named it mountain. We're, now we're in keyframe number one of our timeline because we're generating our symbols prior to creating our length of timeline animation. The reason we're doing that is remember, when you insert a keyframe, it makes a copy of the original keyframe. So if we started making keyframes in our timeline on the mountain underscore BG layer, and we didn't have it as a symbol and decided later that we wanted it to be a symbol, we would have to copy and paste that keyframe backwards, just like we were talking about last week. Well, couldn't we just replicate the keyframes and then we could duplicate the animation? Yeah, you can. You can copy keyframes and paste keyframes. So you wanna make sure that before you animate, before you start the movie build process, you set up everything as best as you can for what your vision is for the animation. Hence, thinking about a little bit, maybe storyboarding a little bit, having a plan before you build. Because once you start building, you can always copy backwards, but it's a lot harder to copy backwards than to just build it correctly. So best practice in animate. In keyframe one, import all of your layers and all of the elements you need for your layers and stack them just like we did last week. We actually imported each one of our things on a different layer and we built everything in keyframe number one. Step two is make sure you create symbols for everything when you import everything into keyframe number one, so that later on, if we want to embed behaviors or start adding interactivity to our solution, we already have everything preset. Yes, you can copy backwards. You can drag from the symbol library into a certain keyframe, but just get in the process of remembering nothing should not be symbolized. Nothing should not be a symbol when you're an anime, even if it's just a graphic symbol because you have to be able to attach behaviors down the road for that. And those behaviors can be imported and exported across applications. So just know that. So try not to make anything. And I know people are gonna make out a book project and they're just gonna throw graphics in that don't do anything. And they're not gonna actually make those symbols because they don't actually do anything in their animation, right? Their background, maybe they just have a character standing off in the distance, that character isn't doing anything. But best practice really is to make everything a symbol because you never know down the road when you might want to use that symbol for something. So it should be attached with an attribute. I only do two symbols. I either have a movie clip or I have a button because buttons are obvious, right? You move your mouse over it. It changes color. It has a behavior associated with it. You click on it and something happens, right? So traditionally text are buttons but it doesn't mean that a logo can't be a button. A person in the animation can't be a button. You can make other things buttons. Just by nature, the user understands buttons as textual. So that's why we will create a text button with the animation that we're doing. Okay, so mountain, it's a graphic, click okay. And you'll notice over here, our object now has its basic attributes its basic properties of what it is based on what we made. So it says it's a graphic, it has an instance of mountain, and we have the ability to do other things. Now, 
we'll adjust some effects and do some different things after we build our animation so you can see how it works. But just know that once we name this thing, it now has an instance, it has a symbol property, and it has the ability to attach action scripting to it. So go up to window and go to workspace and reset it to essential. Mm -hmm. Okay, so under window, you'll notice that the windows, no pun intended, that are open are also right here. So if you don't have library, click library here from the drop down, and it will open it over there. And then click assets, it'll open it over there. So the workspaces are defaulted to a certain series of palettes. That's what those are called. They're called palettes, these things over on the edge. The things on the edge are a grouping of behaviors or things that commonly happen together that they're able to make palettes for. So let's see if you by default didn't open like a 2018 edition. So let's go. So let's go down to the store. Let's go from there. Let's go to let's go down to the find that there. Let's go to the store. Let's go to the store. Let's go to the so let's just switch over to Mac just for the sake of the process here. Um, there, I think 20 is embedded in there somewhere. They just didn't make a folder of it. And it looks like the default is kicking up to 2019. So just take a minute. It's not a big deal. Um, and we'll open it up. Did you save what you're doing on that one? Save it now so then it'll open perfectly fine. While you're doing that, we're going to import a second element and make a symbol out of it, just like we did there. And then you can create that object when you import yours in. Okay, uh, so let's add a new, let's add a new layer and let's go into file import to the stage of that layer. And we're gonna grab the balloon and we're gonna click open and the group is fine and we're gonna hit it. So now we have a new layer number one, just like we did last week. So we're doing the same step up but now that we know the general dashboard and the setup of the timeline, how keyframe works, all that, we can expedite the process into stage two of animate. And so this is our grouped object right now. So remember, you can double click on that. It'll break it apart, but we want it grouped because that grouped object is gonna be what we turn into a symbol. Now, remember last week I said that symbols, which we're doing this week, are like little babushka dolls. So you take the head off and there's something inside of it. You take the head off that doll, there's something inside of it. The beauty about symbols are you can have symbols inside of symbols inside of symbols. Now, try not to get too carried away because the view at the top of your screen up here is going to show when we drill down into something, what the something is that we're inside of. So just be aware of that, that as we're creating these things, we're creating dolls inside of dolls inside of dolls. Okay, so layer number one, uh, let's now rename that to balloon. So we have our background in, that is a graphic symbol. We have layer number, and remember it's background to foreground. So I actually put a pelican or something in there that I was gonna animate, which we'll do in the lecture part. And I may have to move layers a little bit because I might want the pelican to fly in behind the balloon, not in front of the balloon. Yeah, are you okay? So you, have, so you have layer number one with your mountains. So add a new layer down in your timeline first, add a new layer. So it should say layer number one. 
Uh huh. And go to file import to stage. Yep, grab your balloon. Yep, good. All right, are we good? Drop that baby in. It should drop in something like that, right? AI or? Yeah, AI. Yeah, we're importing the vector file. So grab that one. It'll just say grouped objects, yada, 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 hit OK. All right, we're good. So we should still be on keyframe number one. We should now have two layers, a mountain layer, and now rename the layer on top of it as balloon. Now, while we're setting all this stuff up, best practice, I have a plan here. I already know what's going to animate. I have a basic idea where it's going. I'm pre-setting up keyframe number one, all the layers, all the symbols, all the attributes that are going to happen from background to foreground. Okay, good. Uh, so let's right click on the balloon. Let's convert it to a symbol, which is also F8. We're going to name this balloon underscore pink. And the reason I do balloon underscore pink is because I could actually go into the symbol and change the color with a color filter and I can make a purple, a blue. I could change this thing to a bunch of different colors. Uh, so it's good to kind of name it based on some of the behaviors because I could have more than one. You ever go to a balloon festival where there's like a million of them in the sky? It's spectacular. I'm nervous the entire time I'm there because I've seen too many YouTube videos of them crashing in the power lines and stuff. Has anyone ridden a hot air balloon? No, I wish. I'm afraid of heights, so I don't know how high really? I could oh, go I mean, into I, like, that. Off, get so I go hiking. I love to hike. I stay on the inner part of the path. Like some of those heights where you see them on the side of a mountain, it's like le legitimately a drop off and there's no rope. No, <laughs> I'm staying on the inside of that trail. I am not going to the edge of it. You like that? I love like whenever I hike. Black Hills. Uh -huh. I go up this one called uh, Mount Baldy. I thought you were going to say it was like death trail number no, two. <laughs> no, and, it, and, it, and it literally, you have to like rock climb really. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the edge of it. It's not like straight up and down, but you have to like climb through this thing that's called like, it's like a giant crack between two giant rocks. Uh -huh. you have to go yeah, 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 cool. And, yeah, and yeah. then you can get on the top and you add like go to the very edge of it. You can jump around. It's so awesome. So I've mountain climbed indoors when I had a harness on me, but I never looked down. I just <laughs> to the top and I'm like, okay, jump off. And they ease me down. No, no, you don't. Are you tied in? You got to be tied in, right? I know you're not tied in because I've seen many a construction. Dude, there's no way. How do you do it if you're afraid of heights? Mind over matter? You're just staring at the board that you're walking on? Because it's only like six inches wide, right? It's, how wide is it? It's a four inch? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Ain't no way, dude. Ain't no way. I had a two story house. I had to set shutters and everything. So I had to go up on the roofs and stuff. Dude, I was freaked out the entire time I was up there to the point where I paid someone one time just to put them up because it was so nerve wracking. Even though I knew if I fell, I'd probably be okay. <laughs> no way. You're afraid of heights and you walked along those as they craned in the other ones and you lined them up and doo -doo -doo -doo. you're crazy, dude. <laughs> All right, so now we have to do a, a movie clip. So this is the thing that's gonna move and have animations embedded in it, right? This is the babushka doll that you lift the head and there's another doll inside of it. We're gonna drill in a couple of dolls just so that you can see the process, how it works. But uh, we need to see this because when we make armatures and we make skeletal moves next week with the bone tool where we have joints and hinges and multiple symbols, we gotta kind of see how this process works. Okay, all right, so that's good. We'll uh, click okay. Now, why did mine go to a button? Did it scroll by mistake? Let me just double check, it, make sure. Yeah, I know, but I don't know why it defaulted to that. I must've hit my wheel by mistake. Okay, so we have a movie clip. Uh, let's go in and add an instance name because this thing needs the ability to have properties attached to it. So uh, I like to stay in the same genre, but not use the same name because things can get competing at times if it goes from a symbol to an instance to a layer name. So I'm just gonna do uh, balloon. So my instance is balloon pink. 
So let's just do balloon one. Now that instance name is important because my action script is gonna be associated with my clip, with my movie clip. All right, so we have two layers, one graphic, static image, basically grouped and locked, but it's a symbol because we need that to attach behaviors to. Number two is my favorite, which is what I use 90% of the time in Animate is every symbol for me is a movie clip because I wanna be able to embed things inside of things. Uh, and I also wanna be able to control the relationship of that. Um, the button is exactly what it sounds like. It's the other 10% I wanna do because I control how people interact with the content. So imagine if you go to a restaurant, there's a touch screen at your booth and it says pay bill and it has menu and it has about the restaurant and it has uh, beverages and desserts and all of these things. When you click on those textual elements, those are buttons and the animation that happens, the zooming in of pictures, the listing of stuff, those are the movie clips driven by the relationship of movie clip to button. So just know that. And that's what I do with almost every client I have. If I'm not making a web banner, which means an animated element inside of a multimedia solution, in most cases, a web page, I'm creating wireframes. And wireframes are 16 by nine solutions that include branding, animation, and buttons. And that is different from website design because my wireframes for multimedia traditionally are executable files, SWF files or EXE files that are embedded on a hard drive that allows people to interact with the content all included in one object. The difference with web design is you have to have HTML pages, images, source code folders, the whole nine yards. I can create this thing, export it, attach it to a hard drive, and they can make their own embedded multimedia interactive thing, and it doesn't need to be attached to the web. So that's the difference of the solution. So that's okay.
And actually, if you ever went for a graduate degree in a field that requires language knowledge, you can just HTML and actually get the Azure language and it's accepted as a different language. So, and they normally require two languages. So I just HTML because I know how to write it. So it isn't language, it's programming language. It isn't knowing French or Spanish or anything mm -hmm. like that. So um, Adobe CC plays very well together. So we just want to make sure during the learning process, we kind of do best practices because you're going to see a cross pollination when you go from one class to the next where there will be similar terminology or at least similar properties that if you learned it once and you reinforce it again, that is the one thing I like about four weeks, four weeks, four weeks is that you're touching something every month and there's a cross pollination of what we're doing so that you just build a better understanding of what we're trying to do. Okay, all right, so we have movie clip. We have balloon one. Uh, we have our instance of balloon pink. All right, so, and it doesn't matter what that is. The naming is actually semantics. It just helps you later on when you're trying to evolve your multimedia. Uh, under so yeah, yeah, yeah. You're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The good news is this is the first baby step into it. You're going to see a lot of the same things next time, too. The toolbar, the properties windows, where things are located, how the menus work along the top is the same across every application. The only difference is there may be a different application for it based on what the widget thing is you're playing with, right? So if it's HTML, you're going to see the same properties. The properties are just going to be HTML related versus Illustrator where the properties are color, fill stroke, that sort of thing. So it's all in the same place. And in many instances, the terminology is exactly the same. It's just how it interacts with the user based on what the output is. And part of the problem with Adobe is, I think, is that software is starting to cross pollinate where you can do a lot of the things you would have done in one program in another program. So they're dancing that fine line where how much is too, multi too much multimedia in every program? If you could do animations in Photoshop, why would you use animate? If you can animate logos in After Effects, why would you do it in animate? You know? Yeah. 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 We were talking about it last week. Now you can use Affinity as a company and they've started to make applications and they have Affinity Designer as one of their applications. It's 60 bucks, you buy it once, you never have to pay again. It's lifetime updates and it's Photoshop and Illustrator together. Well, why would you have Photoshop and Illustrator if you have vector and pixel-based image manipulation in one program? Actually in 98, I used Corel and Corel was a company that had a program called Draw and they evolved it into Zara X was what they called it. It was Photoshop and Illustrator together. So when I worked for my web company, they actually had me build the wireframes in that program, not Photoshop and Illustrator, because I could bring pictures in, feather them, bring in vector graphics, do everything in one place, and I didn't have to go between two programs. So even back then, and they've been buried, like they never got the, uh, the business saturation with the program, so they never got the following because Adobe's just been the thing that... But Affinity is very quickly creeping up on Adobe because on an iPad, a Samsung Galaxy, your smartphone, they even have desktop versions of it now. You pay once, you can use it for a lifetime versus a monthly multiple, platform. multiple platforms. And it plays nice with Pantone colors and all the things that Adobe always used as their industry standard other companies are becoming very smart and said hey we can charge you once give you lifetime updates we're going for the masses lots of people buy it versus the granular monthly thing and so you're actually going to see adobe i think start going more to the model of if you just want photoshop it's 50 bucks and you get well, unlimited updates I, I spoke to my brother my brother's like i have the cf6 suite you know, he has it all, he has the discs. Has the but keep in mind, when it was that, yeah. when it went to seven, you had to buy it again. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm talking so, about with Affinity, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm Affinity fine. is you bought yeah. Affinity Designer and you got 6.1, 7.1, 8.1, 9.1. Yep, I heard you. Lifetime updates. I, heard you. That's pretty I cool. used to buy $300 Adobe applications too. And then when the next one came out, I had to buy $300. And every 18 months, they updated it. So every 18 months, they got $300. 
I'm talking about unlimited updates. Yeah. And Adobe's going to go there, I think, eventually, because there's too much competition of what we're doing here now. Yeah. And the beauty about this is the terms are the same. The tools even look very similar on Affinity Designer as they do here. Same pen tool, same text T, same shape tool, same line segment, same brush. It's just their icon, but it's the same exact thing, dude. They even have a marquee tool. And I'm shocked that Adobe didn't, the, I call it the marching ants tool, but the selection tool, the marquee tool that we use in Photoshop, they have a marquee tool inside Affinity Designer. And I thought that would be something protected by copyright which wasn't protected by copyright. It shocks me. So it looks almost exactly the same as Photoshop and Illustrator combined. I, I'm amazed. I'm actually leaning towards adding it to my desktops at work and in my home office and starting to pollinate the class a little bit with like, let me just show you this because yeah, yeah. it's- What do you think it's gonna be in the next few years? It's be next few years, I have a feeling it's gonna be another industry standard. You know what I mean? Because lots of companies don't do Macs. They only have PC license. So if a marketing department can add affinity programs and not Adobe, they can run them on any platform. They're not tied to a subscription. Like there's lots of pluses to it. So you'll notice in classes, I teach to the output, not to the software, because there's lots of ways to do things. But Adobe's the industry standard. So the terminology, the toolbar, the behaviors, a lot of things are the same in other programs. So if you get comfortable knowing it here, there are other solutions. Okay, all right, so good. Now we're into our next symbol. So we've imported mountains as a graphic, static grouped object. We imported the balloon as a movie clip. Now we can embed motion inside of it. And then last but not least, we're gonna do a button of some kind. So while we're on frame number one, let's add a new layer. Let's use our text tool. And down here, traditionally play buttons, I always feel like are somewhere over here because you read left to right, top to bottom. So it's kind of this reverse S mentality. I tend to put plays over here and replays over here because that's kind of the end of the animation. So let's just take our text tool, drag a text box, and let's just type in the word play. Now keep in mind, typography is really important. All lowercase is like, uh, kind of like whispering in the hallway. Upper and lowercase is kind of like conversational volume. All caps is like raising your voice. If you add bold to all caps, you're really raising your voice. I wanna do all caps because I wanna make sure the person sees the play button that we're creating and clicks on it in order to make things happen. So we're gonna do all caps. I'm gonna type in play. Now, I'm gonna highlight the text just like Word. Now, you know over there is your properties menu. Pick something that has a little beef to it. So something that has a thickness to it. I'm gonna do something like Helvetica Bold or something like that that has a little weight to it. We're gonna to wanna to change the color too so that you can see it in the mountainscape. So you'll notice the fill down there is blue. We probably wanna make that like white. So let's make it something heavy like Helvetica for character, something a little bit with a little more beef to it and change the color. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go over here. I'm gonna click on my palette and I'm just gonna look for something that is a sans serif. I know Verdana actually has multiple family members too. So bold is one of the options. Helvetica, Ariel, Tahoma, they're all what's called sans serif typefaces. So they don't have little, uh, little decorative feet on the letters. It's just easier to read. So let's go with something that has a little boot beef, Helvetica, Ariel, Verdana, Tahoma, something like that, uh, Century Gothic. And if it has a family member that is bold, that's what that's called, a family member, regular, italic, bold, condensed, semi-condensed, uh, light, ultra thin, those are family members. Ideally, when you use typography and you're here in typography class, you use a maximum of two typefaces in a design and you wanna use a typeface that has the most family members. So you wanna have a typeface that has lots of like bold, italic, condensed, ultra thin, because you can use one typeface that you use several family members and it looks different in your design. So if you use something in regular, something in bold, something italic, you will see different things so just keep in mind, pick something block, sans, we call uh, sans serif. Uh, I picked Verdana, pick bold, 
change your fill color. I think white probably is going to be the best thing for us. Uh, mine defaulted to 60 point as far as point size goes. So that's pretty good because we're going to make it kind of big down there, kind of towards the water. I like anything from 36 to 48 to 60 for play buttons and buttons like that in a 1280 environment because they're big enough people see them. We could also draw a rectangle behind this, put the play button in an actual button shape and then make that the symbol called button, but we're just gonna do text. Knowing that anything we drew in Illustrator, we drew right here on the document, we could select those things together and make them the symbol as all one thing. So I could draw a box around it. I could do whatever I wanted to do. So I'm just gonna click on that. I'm gonna move it down here. We need the play button to be somewhere. Now, don't put it right on the edge. Don't put it just off the edge. And I let people laugh. I'm gonna get something like this where I can't see the P and half the L because they put it there and they're like, well, it was right on the edge of my image. Well, your image went off the edge of the stage. So make sure the rule of thumb is one eighth of an inch off the edge is what you should do for bleeds and textual elements. Use your eye and just kind of, you can use your arrow keys, just be cognizant of what the edge of the document is. Now, if you ever noticed a framed picture, there's more space on the bottom of a frame than there is on the sides and the top. So when you mat a picture in a frame, it's two inch, two inch, two inch, three inch at the bottom of the mat. The reason you do that is the extra thickness of the bottom of the mat frame visually pushes everything up. So it makes your eye stay above the bottom line. So you never see a frame two inch, two inch, two inch, two inch. If you did, cut the mat person because it should be thicker at the bottom than it is on the sides and the top because that visual weight makes your eye stay above the bottom mat line. So just know that as a rule of thumb. I'm kind of moving it equal edge, but in reality, it should be a little more space bottom than on the left-hand side, but just make it where someone's gonna see it. We made it white, so it's there, so we can kind of see what's going on. Now, let's name this one over here on our layer. Let's double click layer number three and let's name it uh, play. I'm gonna turn the all caps off because I don't need myself yelling at myself for the layers. So let's do play underscore BTN. So underscore button, BTN is just button. So I know that's the behavior. Mountain is underscore BG because I know it's the background. My objects in the middle and the foreground, I traditionally just name after what the thing is because I know if it's not a BTN or a BG, it's some object that's having something happening to it. All right, so we got our play button. Now we need to make this thing a play button, right? So we got to right click or control click it. We need to convert it to a symbol. We need to make this thing a button. I'm gonna move this down just a skosh if I can. I'm gonna click. Okay. All right, so now I have my play button. I'm gonna give it an instance name of play. Oh, I already have the instance attached to that. Uh, so let's do play uh, action. Yeah. No spaces, never any spaces. I could do an underscore if I wanted to. Okay, so we officially have what, three layers, right? Let me move my layer palette up here a little bit. I wonder if I can tuck this thing. Oh, good. That thing drives me crazy. Uh, okay. All right, so now we have three layers, right? We have our background, we have our animated thing, and we have our play button. So now we have to extend out our frames for our background to how long we want our animation to happen. Because the background's always gonna stay there. Keeping in mind that we could change backgrounds from one area of our animation to another. So we could add frames to our mountains layer for two seconds, add a new layer called ocean and start the ocean 
graphic symbol at frame 61 and go to 90. And in essence, we made the movie have two backgrounds of which we can animate across multiple backgrounds. So it's like taking the bottom piece of paper out and replacing it, but having everything animating across the two pieces of paper. So we could do that. And when you look at animations, oftentimes it's a zoom out and a zoom in of the same background. So all they did at frame 61 was transform the background, make it bigger with a new keyframe. And it goes from zoom out to zoom in. So just know that that can happen all on our background layer, or we could replace the image with whatever new image we want. Uh, and I was just teaching that last night with cut screens, that when you go from one part of the video to the next, you can splice it, put a transition in it, and it makes it look like you're bouncing around cinematically. Uh -huh. So in essence, think about that. We're doing something in motion and the background can cut from one scene to the next with zero transition or retransition. And we can bounce around from zoom out to zoom in, to pan across, that sort of thing. And we could actually animate this background across and it would give motion to the background. So just visualize that as a storyboard. So let's go and we could just highlight or you can go to frame 60 and right click and do insert frame. And now we have our background, right? So it's there, it goes to frame 60, which is two seconds, right? So all we did was insert frame and we went from frame one to frame 60, but you'll notice that layer two and layer three are only keyframe one, nothing is happening. After frame one, right? So that's a very easy thing to see, but not always easy to recognize in a file that things have a start and stop for each layer based on its visibility or where you see it and how it moves. So we've defined the mountains are not gonna move and it's gonna be zero or one to 60. So two seconds long. So everything's gotta happen inside two seconds. Now, if we can lock that now, exactly. We can lock that now. I wouldn't recommend hiding it, although some designers do that. As they finish something, they just hide it and they work in one element at a time. So they animate the balloons next, then we hide it. Then they activate the button, then we hide it. And then when we're done, they turn everything back on. I do, I import audio last because it loops over and over again, literally. And based on the power of your machine, it may start and stop and start again while the other one isn't done stopping. And you'll hear the same delayed drag over and over again. So there's actually wave music in the background of this, but we're not gonna bring it into the very end. All right. All right, so mountain is frozen. So let's go back to keyframe one on the balloon layer. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna scale it up. I think we need it to be bigger. So I'm just gonna go to transform. I'm gonna scale it up. and I'm gonna move it. But this time I think for our animation, I'm actually gonna move it off the page. So let's move it off the page. Remember this is a movie clip, so we can do stuff inside of it, but we're gonna move it first as a grouped object. And then we're gonna animate inside of it after we figure this out. So. In the course of two seconds, we need this thing to move all the way across the page and disappear off the other page. And we could do keyframe, 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 keyframe and slowly nudge that thing along, or we can tween the motion from one edge of the document to the other edge of the document, which we also call onion skinning, which means it actually fills in the onion skin. You know, when you peel an onion skin, it's skin, 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 skin. Although I love onions, I can eat them like an apple. Uh, you can just peel them away and it's layer after layer after layer. It fills in the layer after layer after layer all the way across the page. So we've got to go to frame 60. So we're going to go to frame 60. We're going to click our mouse and we're going to right click and we're going to insert a keyframe. And now you'll see that frame one is over on the left hand side and frame 60, it's still over on the left hand side. I want to I like to hold down shift so it doesn't move up or down. And I'm just gonna drag the balloon symbol, hold down shift, I'm gonna drag it and put it off the other edge. 
so yeah it just makes it from going up and down it keeps it in alignment so just hold down shift and move it across the other page are we okay so if i click on keyframe one on the balloon layer it should be on the left hand side if i click on keyframe 60 it should be on the right hand side now we can click anywhere inside the timeline and right click it and apply a tween to it now we're going to do a classic tween and then we're going to attach a motion guide to make it motion so let's Yep, let's do classic tween. And you should now notice that this thing drifts across the page. And as long as you hold down shift, it should go perfectly in alignment across the page. Now, remember, this is a movie clip, which means thinking ahead, babushka doll inside babushka doll, I could go inside the symbol and make her arms wave, her eyes blink, her head nod, but it's all happening in two seconds. So I need to make sure anything I do inside of the symbol happens over the course of two seconds. So that's the catch with the babushka doll inside of the babushka doll. You can always do edit undo. Command Z. Yeah. Mac is command Z. So you should have two keyframes, one at one, one at 60, and now there should be some shaded purple inside of there. All right, so we're traveling from left to right. Very simple way to do it. But keep in mind, if we were doing a horse racing animation, we can make the horse a movie clip. Move it left to right as if it's running down the track and just change the legs. And because it's not doing anything but a straight line, we could change the size of it so it pops forward, goes back. We can do anything amongst the path of this thing to make it look like it running. One of the students did a horse racing, uh, the straightaway for their final project. And it was pretty good. The horses were all kind of different speeds and the legs were going. She used the uh, bone tool to make sure the hinges of the elbows and the feet and the hoofs and everything was smooth. And that's not an easy task to get an animal moving smoothly, but, uh, and then she had the little jockey whip thing going and she did a really great job. So just know that if it's a straight line, we can do a basic motion and move it along that straight line and it still looks really good but the balloon probably is going to need to drift a little bit at least uh, so we're going to add a motion guide to our movement which means it follows along a path so now that we have our layer created for the balloon and it has a classic motion attached to it we're going to right click on the balloon layer and add a classic motion guide doesn't matter where. Now, you may have seen inside other Adobe programs subsets, which is what this is. When you create a clipping mask or when you uh, add an effects property to an object in Photoshop, you get a subset of or a behavior of the thing that's above it. And in essence, this subfolder or this tab that's happening in the layers is just telling you that the thing above it is controlling the thing below it. The thing above it is attaching a behavior to the thing below it. And you'll see that in Photoshop layers. You'll see it in a lot of instances in Adobe that if there is an indent of something stacked on top of it, it means the behavior above it is controlling the thing below it. Now, I'm gonna move the playhead, this little thing here, back to the beginning. 
because I need to create a path for this thing to follow along. But the path has to be visible from keyframe one all the way to the end. And you'll notice there isn't another keyframe, it just filled it in as frames. What it's telling me is I need to put something at keyframe one on the guide layer behavior that will be controlled for this thing moving along its motion the entire time. So that's all we're doing. We're creating a guide, some shape or line for this thing to follow. Now, the easiest, most natural thing is to like use the pencil tool and draw a shape that isn't straight. So don't use line segments because it'll only do the same thing that it did with the straight plastic tweening. A shape, a line, a path of some kind for this to follow along. So I need to use, I'm gonna use the pencil tool. Now, it needs to be smooth. So don't like stop halfway along the line and then start doing the line again. Can I choose the pen tool so it makes it more rounded? You and... can if you're comfortable with the pen tool. Okay. Not everyone's used the pen tool I've too much. I've used it a million times by Photoshop and Illustrator. Fine. You can use the paintbrush tool, honestly, if you wanted to. Um, but let's just create some fluidity of a line uh, for us to follow our path. So you'll notice the playhead goes all the way back. I have the guide layer selected, because remember, you have to select the layer that you're on. I'm going to use the pencil tool and I'm just going to draw. This mouse is terrible. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. It's going to go in a circle. Dude, this mouse is terrible. Like somebody spilled something on here and it doesn't do well. So I need to do something along the line of this. So it goes on and it goes off and it kind of does this thing to it. I'm gonna lock the balloon layer just to make sure that it doesn't attach to the balloon layer. I'm gonna drag that across. So if the pencil gets too close to the balloon, it tries to draw it as part of the balloon. So I just locked that layer for a minute just so that I could draw my line without it conflicting with or trying to compete with the balloon itself. So I'm gonna draw my line and then I'm gonna use my selection arrow. I'm gonna unlock the balloon layer and you're gonna notice, see how this thing snaps to the guide? So it's trying to find the line or the guide for this thing to start at. So once you have that guide drawn, it should try to attach itself. Now you're gonna notice, see how it doesn't know yet the end of it because this thing hasn't been snapped to the other area of the line. So you see how I moved it and snapped it to the line. So now it knows the end. So it's starting, it's following this path. And so now I need to make sure that this thing goes all the way to the end. And so now you'll see that this balloon is following this path. It's tricky to get at first. The, the center circle is the waist or the pivot point of our animation. So yeah, so make sure that you both position the keyframe one with the balloon at the beginning of your line, it should snap to the line and then go to frame 60 for your keyframe to the end of it and move that thing to the middle of the line just so it snaps. And then do your playhead to make sure it follows the first half of the line and then move it to the end and it should follow the line. So it should do this. Now, if we test our movie, control test movie, you're gonna see we have a problem. She's actually moving pretty quick, but she's popping at a weird space and you're gonna notice the play button flicks for one second and disappears. Well, that's a problem because there's no way we're gonna be able to click that thing because it disappears 
after one thirtieth of a second. Yes. All right. So before we do that, let's change. Let's add keyframes in the middle of our tween so we can change the scale of our balloon in and out. And we could even rotate it a little bit so it looks like it's wobbling as it's going in the wind, which kind of freaks me out. Don't wobble it too far because then it'll look like it's tipping over. But if we like move our mouse, so you see the, the balloon goes and goes and goes, and I'm just dragging my playhead. And at like frame 21, it starts to wiggle down. I'm going to go to frame 20 on my timeline and I'm going to insert a keyframe. So you'll notice the motion is still continuing, but now there's a keyframe in there that's saying something is going to change. Something is going to change along our animation. Now, we can insert as many keyframes as we want along the balloon animation and rotate, scale down, adjust the balloon but still keep it following its line. So I'm going to insert the keyframe at 20. I'm gonna pick my transform and I'm gonna hold down shift and I'm gonna scale it down a little bit. So you'll notice now the balloon comes in and at keyframe 20, it's a certain size and it's gonna scale itself back up. So you see how it gets small like it's going away from us. And then it starts to kind of go back up. So what I need to do is I want you to insert four or five keyframes along the path of the balloon and either change the size or rotate the balloon a little bit. And remember, if I insert a keyframe, so this thing starts to wobble. So you see how it goes to that line and then it moves? At that keyframe, I'm going to insert a keyframe and I'm going to rotate it a little bit. So you see how you move it off the edge of scale and you get rotate? I'm going to rotate this thing just ever so slightly to the right. So now look what's happening. It drifts across, gets smaller, and because my line wiggles, my balloon now wiggles. So now at the next wiggle, which is right there, I'm gonna insert a keyframe and I'm gonna wiggle it back. So now you can really see what's happening. It's drifting away, it's wiggling to the right, it's wiggling to the left, and it's gonna straighten up to go across the screen. Now, I like to hide the motion guide, even though you don't see it when you publish the movie. I like to click the eyeball on the motion guide so I don't see it while I'm building my animation either. But in this case, I need to see the guide because I have some wiggles in my line. Like I have some wiggles in my line. So I need to be able to see the guide in order to see where this thing rocks left, where it rocks right. And so now it gets smaller, like it's going away from us. It wo woggles to the right, it wobbles to the left, it straightens back up, but I need it to straighten back up in this straight away. So I'm gonna insert a keyframe. I'm gonna rotate it back so it's level. Actually, I might wiggle it to the right out of level. And then I'm gonna make it bigger. I'm actually gonna make it bigger at the end. So it's bigger than it was at the start. So it's closer to us. Yes. So anywhere along your timeline, you can click your mouse inside that frame and right click it and do insert keyframe. So anywhere along your timeline, insert a keyframe. Once you insert the keyframe, if you have the keyframe selected, you can pick transform instead of select, and you can either scale it up or down 
hold down shift so it does it from the center or go just off the edge and you can rotate it. So you'll notice I have one, two, three, four, five, six keyframes for my animation. And it looks like this when it rotates. So she's wobbling pretty good. That would make me have some serious issues with my traveling in the balloon, but she seems to like it. So. Is there a way that I can delete a keyframe that I accidentally- uh, Just right click on it. In? Just right click on it and delete. Okay, because like I tried to delete it, but it like stayed there. So it goes to a white screen again because I made it at 61 instead of 60, but I made everything else at 60. So let's do it. I think it would just be like, but see, I accidentally clicked 60. Yeah, one of that 60. Just, yeah, just remove. There we go. Okay, that's what I thought yeah. I was going to do, but. Is that your pen tool line? That's not too bad. I, I, I decided to use. So, scale, rotation are really good things in motion because it's bringing foreground and background together in one, even though we're in a two dimensional or flat space. So. But yeah, I ended up using a pencil tool. Okay. Because then I could just like flip it around. Uh -huh. Now, remember, this is all happening inside two seconds. So now when we go inside the symbol to move her arms, we need to make sure she's not like this because it'll loop over and over again and she'll move her arms over and over again. So we need to make sure any movement that happens, maybe we just want her arms to move like one second, like at one second she moves them. It's okay. So you can actually just click on that keyframe once. You just click on it once, go over here, that's a keyframe, then click and hold your mouse down, and you can move it. So just move it over one more. Yep, one more. That's okay. Just click on it again, move it over one more. Good. And now just click on the, you can highlight those. Hold on. You can just highlight those two. So just click on it and highlight. Yep. And just right click and do remove. Okay. Oh. Now you're you're back at it. That's okay. So once you move your playhead back to where it should be, there is your thing. Okay. Yeah. 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 Now you're good. So okay. do you travel along it okay? Do you have keyframes in there? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Test the movie and you should have something that happens like this. And it's looping over and over again because we haven't given it any behavioral elements. We haven't told it to start and stop anywhere, all of which we have to use action script to do. But we'll get there. We're just doing this. Okay. All right. So let's close. I probably should have done this over maybe three seconds. She's moving kind of fast. I don't know if I would like that balloon ride, but she's covered a little more territory in two seconds. But I wanted to get it off the page so that you could see the play button, how it all works. And all right, so now, anywhere along the line, I traditionally like to go back. I always like to start back at the beginning. So I'm moving my playhead all the way back to frame number one. I'm going to use my selection tool, my top selection tool. One of the best practices I tell students when you're working in Adobe, once you do some kind of change, pen tool, shape tool, text tool, selection tool, any of the tools you're using in the toolbar, best practice is to go back to the selection arrow. Because if you don't want to draw another line, paint another line, uh, select another area, Best practice is always to go back to the selection tool. At least I've known it to be. That way I don't draw too many lines. I don't do something I didn't want to do. Um, and I get everything the way I want it. Okay, so we're back to frame number one. I always go back to frame number one too, because a lot of times I'm building instances and properties that start at the first frame and go all the way through the animation. Okay, so now we need to select the balloon. Now you could select the balloon anywhere along the timeline because we're going inside the symbol. It doesn't matter where we select it along the timeline, but for students, I found it going back to the beginning 
makes them realize that if we go inside this symbol and it exists for 30, 60 frames, whatever we do inside of it, we need to take into account what's going to happen over two seconds. So don't do something inside the symbol like uh, wave her arms and only have her arms wave over 10 frames because she will wave over and over and over again. And, and she'll look like this, or I've had students blink the eyes, but they did the blink with keyframe at one, keyframe at two, one eye open, the next eye closed over two. So it happened 30 times over the course of the animation, and it looked like a seizure or something, like the eyes were just blinking over and over again. So keep in mind that anything we do inside of the symbol, it has a timeline inside of itself, has to happen over 60 seconds. So the reason I do everything at the first frame and start building the elements one layer at a time is once I want to go inside something or do something behavioral wise to them, I want to make sure I pre-planned out how long this thing's going to happen. So she could drift along the ocean scene for 60 seconds, for 60 frames or two seconds, and I could add a new layer or add a new keyframe on the mountains layer at 61 and zoom that in and continue the animation zoomed in. So I could bring the balloon back in closer to the mountains and have it continue to drift. We're just working in a two second window. All right, so now we have the animation, I think the way we want it. I like to hide the guide, even though in the final published video, you don't see it because it's determined as a guide. When I'm done with my animation and I have it the way I want it, I hide the guide. So even if I don't publish my video, it does what I want it to do. So see, it still follows the line. You just don't see the line inside of the lock, lock the guide. Yeah, you can lock it and hide it and all of those good things. And we're actually going inside of the symbol so we can double click and go in there and have the stuff locked if we wanted to. So um, just for the sake of the process, yeah, let's lock the guide so we don't mess around with it. All right, so I'm on frame one, keyframe one. I could be on frame 20, keyframe two, and double click on this. And you're going to notice a couple of things. Now, very important, the hardest part to understand and animate out of everything is the fact that it's a folder system which means you're going to see that we're inside symbol, balloon, whatever you name it. You'll notice the background is ghosted out and we have a new timeline, which means we're inside the symbol. Could I import new graphics in the timeline inside the symbol and not put them on the timeline outside the symbol? Could I add wavy lines trailing the balloon inside the symbol yes. and it'll follow the balloon, but they actually don't exist outside the symbol. They, they don't exist on the scene, but they only exist on the balloon. Yes. So we could make squiggly lines. We could make those squiggly lines movie clips and inside the squiggly lines, make them wave. We can drill down inside of the symbol in as many symbols as we want. Inception. Yes, Inception, yes. And it will show in the play screen, but you won't see it necessarily all happening in the scene. So if we embed it in here, that's the biggest trick for students sometimes. If we embed it in here as an animation inside of itself, when we play the movie, the extra sounds, the extra stuff will appear. When it's nested inside of nests, it doesn't necessarily show outside in the scene. So you could actually add audio? Oh audio. yeah, oh yeah, it's its so own like timeline. You wanted to add <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. And then the timeline, instead of in the scene, will actually have its own audio. Yes, so a frog could be sitting on a rock on ribbit. Ribbit, but it could be cricket sounds in scene one have its own sound inside of sound inside of sound. Keeping in mind that the best viewing of stuff inside of stuff inside of stuff is the SWF file that's exported or the controls test movie where it packages everything up into the executable and it plays it the way it should. 
Sometimes there's, I don't hear sound inside a sound because it's nested in there and animate as a program is just showing you the folder you're in, not the folder inside of the folder, if that makes sense. It can only generate itself so much. So, but you can get as complicated. I've had eyes blink black and then one blink red and have sounds inside of sounds that all happen upon command. So you move your mouse over something that goes ribbit, you know, versus the cricket noise in the marsh. I mean, you can attach it to the behavior of the symbol based on what the behavior is. So if it's a button, it can have its own sound like whoosh or kachink or whatever. And the video itself can have a sound and there can be a sound associated to the movement so the frog rivets when you put his mouse over because he's a button and then you click on him and his tongue comes out and catches a fly. The fly could have its own sound. It's a movie clip. Oh, you know what I mean? So it's like, right? Everything happened. But to truly capture what is happening, you want to test the movie so that it packages it into an executable because everything has a behavior. Okay, so we need to wave the arms of this poor girl. Now, you'll notice that it grays everything out and we're just inside and there's a new timeline. Sometimes that's really tricky for students because they're like, where are the mountain layers? Where are all the keyframes? We're inside of itself. And you'll actually notice it's now just a grouped object. So if I right click on this and say break apart, it's not a symbol, it's a group. The group is the inside babushka doll. The symbol is the outside babushka doll. It's the easiest way I could explain it is doll inside a doll inside a doll. So the outside doll is the symbol, the inside doll is the grouped object. So now we go back to our uh, keyframe by keyframe, just for the instance of using this, we could make this a symbol inside the other symbol and tween that. So it could rock inside of here on top of rocking outside. We can really get this thing going or whatever the thing is, right? So that's the creative problem solving. When does the frog's knuckle raise? When does his eye blink before he sticks his tongue out? That frog is just one illustration, but the symbol is a movie clip frog. The head of the frog is a symbol. When you double click on that symbol, inside of that, his eyes are symbols that are movie clips. And everything can have its own timeline animation inside of itself. So that's how you get really complicated looking animations even though there's only three visible symbols inside the movie, the problem is everything inside of it is a symbol. And that's important to understand because next week we're gonna, I don't know what we're gonna animate yet. I normally do like robots and mechanical things. Maybe we'll be do a dinosaur or something, but every bone of the skeletal property of the thing we're trying to animate is a symbol. And every bone symbol has a joint and every joint gets attached from the waist and it becomes, you ever see, you, I'm sure you've seen them when they make video games and stuff and they put the dots on the characters and they put them on a green screen and they move them. It's to connect the skeletal joints of the character to make the computer motion smooth like the skeletal motion of the character. They do basketball, the EA sports, they put, I don't know, LeBron James, they put him in a suit with little dots, but they actually built the 3D version of him already in the game. All they do is attach the motion of the 3D character to the skeleton joints that he did with natural motion. And that's how you get the dunks and the jumper and everything that looks so good. It's because they use an armatron or an armature process where they connect the bones joint to joint. So understanding that things can have multiple symbols and symbols inside of symbols is important because next week when we move to armature or natural motion, you need to know that each part of a graphic that came in grouped can be symbols. So we left these objects grouped and we grouped it as one big symbol. Next week, we're gonna bring it in and break it apart and make every element of the illustration its own symbol, which means we can make natural motions and we can get someone running and jumping and doing all those natural things. So it's as simple as three symbols, a graphic, a movie clip and a button, but it's as complicated as what you do from a behavioral standpoint inside of 
an action script associated with that creates the interactivity of the motion. So you'll see very simple, like the intro screen for animate where the little seahorse goes up and the little jellyfish comes up, that's simple. Then you can see things like the Volkswagen commercial where the guy's eyes are blinking, he's moving around, he's got armatures, so he's natural motion, the car pulls in, it blinks. Like all of that is the extreme aspect of having three basic symbols all inside one movie timeline or scene. Simple as you wanna make it or as complicated. And I've had students spend hours and hours and hours to get something smoothly moving because they're like, man, there's a hiccup there. I wanna adjust this a little bit. Let's add an extra keyframe. Or you can put it together and get it pretty smooth like we did with the balloon. I could micro change that and tint it a little bit and get it to wiggle a little bit more and move some other things. But I think we have a good thing going here. So now, we need to figure out, it's two seconds long. We wanna move our hands on the rope at some point in time. So we need to figure out, do I wanna move her arms at, I don't know, one second and then move them back at two seconds? So I think I wanna add a keyframe at one second and another keyframe at two seconds. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because I want to make sure the two second keyframe has the same arm position as keyframe number one. So I'm pre thinking keyframe number one, she would be like this. Keyframe number two, she would go down like this. And keyframe number three, at two seconds, she's going to move her arms back, right? I could add a keyframe here and then copy this keyframe and paste it at two seconds if I wanted to. But I'm kind of old school, so I pre-plan out what I'm going to do. I could make her eyes blink at one second also, or open up. There's lots of things I can do. So I'm going to go in, and at one second, I'm going to insert a keyframe. And then at two seconds, I'm going to insert a keyframe, right? So this is the same as frame by frame. I could make this a symbol at keyframe number one and name it balloon two, and then insert in my keyframes if I wanted to tween the arm motion. I'm just gonna make them pop up and pop back down. But I could make this a symbol movie clip called balloon two or balloon arm motion, and then insert the keyframes. But remember, you wanna make the symbol at keyframe number one. So when you insert the other keyframes, it's inserting a symbol of the balloon. I'm just gonna make her arms wiggle a little bit. Are you okay? Did you unfreeze? Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. I have the balloon selected. I'm just holding the space bar down. Space bar lets me move around my document with the hand. That way I don't have to change tools. So I just hold the space bar down, I can pan. Now I need to move my playhead to the keyframe where I want something to happen, right? So I'm moving it to one second because that's where I want something to happen. And you're also gonna notice that it's grouped, like this object actually is still grouped. So I need to right click on this and do break apart. Now here's where group upon group upon group could happen, that's what we saw in week one. If I break this apart, so if I right click and break it apart, you'll notice now, that I have separate bounding boxes for some elements of the illustration, right? So now that has a bounding box, but I don't know if I can grab just her arms on the first break apart. So let me deselect and then click on the arm. Just tap over here. So I just tapped in the stage and it deselects. So now I'm gonna click on her arm and I believe her arm is grouped. And I can check it by doing my transform and I'm just gonna rotate it. See, it's still a person, she's all attached. So I'm gonna undo that. So you should at keyframe one second, right click on the girl as a whole because I need to break apart her arms, no pun intended. <laughs> so let's right click on the girl and do break apart. And now you'll notice when the second break apart, I have her arms separate. So now you can deselect by just tapping your mouse over here. And now I'm gonna click on her first arm. So there it is. 
I'm going to do my transform controls, which is this little transform thing. And I'm going to rotate her arm and I'm going to, I'm going to use my arrow keys and move it down. So there she is moving that arm down. So now if I take my playhead, see that? She's moving her arm down. Are we okay? So see? Yeah, that's all it's gonna do. Cause remember, she's just gonna put her hand down and move it back up. So it's just gonna look like she's moving a little bit. And remember when you do motion inside of motion, it's subtle things that over time you may recognize that you didn't see at first. Like what I'm doing, like an animation of an animal, sometimes I'll change the color of their dots in some part of the animation or whatever the texture is they have on them. And until you watch the video over and over again, you don't realize that a hair moved or some aspect of it changed. So I'm gonna select your other arm too. And I'm gonna rotate that. I'm just gonna move it down a little bit. And I'm gonna move it over a little bit too, just so that it hides behind her body a little bit. And you'll notice that it should do something like that. Now, the reason I did one second is because it will go back at the end of the animation. So you see that? And I did it over two seconds, so she only moves her arm once in the animation. If you did it over a half a second, she would look really nervous, <laughs> like back and forth in the animation. So part of storyboarding or understanding motion is understanding, it's kind of like when someone designs for the first time, they make all the words too big. When they get more comfortable in how visual elements work, they make the letters smaller. Like everyone immediately makes body copy 16 point, but it's okay at 12 point because they are learning visual communication. Animation, everyone starts really quick choppy stuff. And then as they kind of mature to storyboarding, timelining and how long something should take, they start adjusting the speed of things. So now if we want to go out of the inside of the symbol, we either have to double tap outside the balloon or click on the word that says scene number one. Know that this is a folder, so we got to click over here to get outside oh. of it. So now look at the timeline. It's the original timeline. That's hard to recognize at first, that there's stuff inside of stuff. And when you're inside something, it appears along the tab system. And so now let me just test my movie. And you see her arms, they do move. They move at the middle of the screen. Hers moved down. All right, so let's see what happened. Now it's subtle, but she moves her arms down. So she moves them when she rocks. So she's getting a little nervous. She grabs down on the rope. All right, so double click on your balloon. Yep, yep, I'm going to one. All right, so now you're inside the balloon. All right, she looks fine, so she moves back. All right, she moves back, so let's go back to scene one. All right, so now when you do that, you're not going to see it. Remember, it's nested inside us, so let's go to control. Oh, you'll have to test the movie. Remember, same with embedded sounds. So now if you do it, she should. Now you can do it by control. That's it, that's it. Yeah, because you're actually going outside of the program to test it versus just testing it inside of the program. So let's just do it that. Yeah, you can go to test movie in the and it will make a browser window like mine 
and all it's doing is running the SWF file inside of the program versus exporting it to the browser, which is what it's doing. It's in essence saving a copy of it out in your folder and running it outside of Animate. So it's loading, in essence, all of your behavior temporarily in the browser outside of the program. So give it a minute because now we're going to see what's wrong. All right, good job. So her arms are moving. I think just for the sake of the process, let's go to the one second keyframe and use our line segment tool and put a couple of dashed lines just to make it look like it's like, woo. Now it's gonna happen quick, but it'll at least give her some trail lines, I think. So let's see, we're gonna close this. I'm gonna double click. I'm gonna go to my one second, which is right here. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and I'm gonna add, just for the sake of the process, Let's just throw a wiggle line or two. All right, so I put three little trail lines there just to show movement. So you can see they stay there for about a second. And so now let's go back to the scene. Now, remember, if I just play it here, you don't see it because it's a, it's a motion inside of a motion. But you see how you can do test movie in animate and it will run itself inside of. So I just added a few trail lines to her just to show you that you can add objects inside of symbols. Now I should probably add another keyframe and get rid of the lines so they don't appear for so long, but you get the idea that you can do stuff inside of stuff and you can add new elements inside of elements. The key is you gotta know which folder you're in in order to do that thing. Now, that brings us to the last kind of part of the process, which is adding behaviors to, adding actions to, your movie that you're making in order to control how the user, did it load or no? Stuck. It's stuck inside exporting out of the browser, which is weird because it's a pretty high power So I don't know what is going on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's trying to run it off your thumb drive. I'm going to click on that. I know it's going to take a few seconds for it to register that I click cancel. But there you go. Give it a second. And then you can go to control. Just go to control. Oof, now it's going to save a recovery save. So just give it a minute. So test movie in anime. And it should pop up. But we are running it off your thumb drive. So it's still going to take, take a second, which is fine. Um, the nature of the beast is, um, is that ideally, just kind of thinking ahead going forward. Take that folder, drag it to the desktop, make the changes at the end of the night, make an override. I actually have the students do a uh, save like B2. Yep, and then yeah. you have the original B2, and then every time you make a change, it becomes a new. It'll be quicker this way, though, because it's testing it in the movie, but it is running the script commands. That's what's taking a few seconds. Okay. That's okay. You're perfectly fine. You're doing great, actually. You got a nice seamless animation. You got all your symbols and everything. You got everything working. So we're kind of all on the same page now. Uh, so now, huh? Talking to yourself? <laughs> it's okay. I have headphones. I have headphones I put on my AirPods. And when I'm working, the world is like gone to me. And I just am in my own little thing. Um, I do about five or six clients at a time on top of teaching full time and doing everything else. So I have my own design business. So at night, sometimes when I go home, even after here at 10 or 10.30, I could be making a logo, creating a web page. I could be doing any number of things. So I have a process for depending on what I'm doing. But you know what? That gets back to the look and feel. Like we talked yeah. about week one yeah. where everyone has their own innate yeah. abilities. I've just over 25 years. Yeah. 
I've just learned things that people like about what I do that I can replicate over and over again, down to presets in Photoshop and I can click on a command and it'll run the same process on images for the same client over and over again. And I can batch reset everything in like a five minute command, which is nice because you bill them out for an hour and it took you five minutes to do the process. So as you get comfortable, you can do that. You'll notice web design companies have one look and every client, they replicate the same look over and over again, but they build the, they build the client based on the original development time and they can do it in a quarter of the time because they've already set the process and they just replicate it over and over and over again. So if the process was 5,000 for the first client and it took 10 hours, the second client is three hours, but they still charge them 5,000 because it was the original tool set that they created. So it's genius. I mean, it's part of time is money, right? It's like anything. When I lay floor, I get better at it every single time. And so a room that took me five hours now takes me an hour, but I'm still paying myself for the five. <laughs> five hours it took me for the original all right you can mess around with the nuances of that i do want to get to the okay. button behaviors like, I, and stuff is my girl isn't moving her arms when i put her into the actual thing i don't know what's happening so did you test the movie or are you just viewing it from the outside scene one uh, that's probably what i did yeah so oh, go wow. to <laughs> go to control test movie in animate and Behaviors that happen inside of behaviors. Oh yeah, okay. So I, was, I know. Yeah. So Sorry, that's, I had like a thing So like a as problem. it gets more complicated, you've got to make sure that you default to testing the movie so that things happen because you can have sounds inside. I mean, it can get really crazy. I mean, I mean, I've had seven dollars worth of stuff just inside, 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 and it makes it look so cool, but it just. And it looks simple from the outside. It's just a lot of things inside of it. Um, so I was joking with you, but the first job I had was Flash, which is what this used to be. And I spent literally one client nine months to create a five minute animation. But it was a $80,000 job. So, but I played the same music, animated the same things, at that time, it was 24 frames per second. Do the math over five minutes. It's thousands of frames. And I would be working in a playhead area that was, you know, 30 seconds for, for a week, 30 seconds for a week, just to get it. And then the client would be come and be like, oh, could we just adjust this or change this? But luckily, I had set the process up where it's much easier if the behavior's inside of behaviors. All right. So... Now, we need to add some frames to the play button. So uh, we actually don't need to, because I'm actually going to stop the command, and then we'll animate based on the command. So all right, so the first thing we have to do is we have to put a stop command on our timeline, telling our movie not to go forward. Because remember, it loops by nature. So there's nothing telling it to start or stop. So it's just looping as a behavior. So what we're going to do is we're going to move our playhead to frame one. We're going to have everything deselected. So we're not selecting any objects because if we select an object, the action script will apply to the object. We want to apply it to the move. So we're at frame number one, keyframe number one, nothing selected, right? because we've got to go into our code and tell it, just stop. Like, we don't want you to move yet. We don't want you to move yet and we, until we tell you to move. Because if not, this thing is going to loop over and over again. Now, banners, they animate, right? When you open up a web page, multimedia. But if you build a wireframe, which means an executable that has buttons that makes people interact with, interactive map, a menu, uh, a tour of something, you want them to look at the static and then based on their command, go to the thing you want them to go to. So like when you go to a place like a zoo, if they have a touchscreen interactive map, it's the whole map until you click tigers and then it zooms in to where the tigers are on the map. But it's static until you create an action with the consumer or the user of what you're doing. 
Now, web banners, they just animate. And at the end of it, it's a stop command and the button replay tells you to go back to frame one. So it animates right when you log on. We're only doing this because I want there to be a play button for this thing to start. And then I want a, it to stop. And then I want a replay button for it to go back and play it again, just so that you can see we're controlling the user. Okay, so we have nothing selected. It's just the program at playhead number one. And we need to go into window actions. So window actions. Now, I'm just gonna move it over here for a second. Now, this is where things get a bit scary for some people because we're actually going to attach code to the movie based on what we have selected in order for this thing to interact. So we have nothing selected right now. So we're actually gonna go into our little code snippet. So you see those little greater than, less than symbols? This is the area that says, hey, do you wanna put something in there that we've already predetermined? Dreamweaver has it too, they have code snippets. We're gonna do basic action script. Remember it's action script three is the code we're running off of. And these are all of the possible behaviors in action script three that you can associate to a symbol, to the movie, but we're gonna stick with the baby steps and we're gonna just go into basic timeline navigation. So basic timeline navigation. So if we double click on timeline navigation, you're gonna notice stop at this frame. So if we double click on stop at this frame, you'll notice there is now an action layer with a little A. The little A means, hey, we have action script associated at frame number one. So we're telling it to just stop, right? Don't play forward yet. Like just stop at frame number one. Just show them the big beginning of the movie with the play button visible now. I'm gonna keep the action window open just so that I can see my scripting because I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna select my play button. And you're gonna notice hmm, that thing cleared. The reason it cleared is because it wants to know what behaviors do you wanna to attach to the button that is separate from the movie action that's happening inside of the movie itself. So we're attack we stopped the movie at frame one because it's not associated with anything. We didn't select any objects. It's just the movie itself. We're gonna go into code snippet now. So let's click on go code snippet. Go, click to go to frame and play. So which frame do I want the play button to go to and play? Well, yes, but we want the button to not be there after you click on it so that it runs. So if you know that as a factor, what frame would you send it to to start it playing? Look at the timeline. Where does the play button disappear? No. Oh, it disappears on one. It disappears on two, two right? One, it's visible, two, it isn't. So if we have a stop command on the movie, you see no balloons at the play button. If you click the play button, if we go to frame two and play, the button disappears, but the animation runs along. So we want to select the button and go to frame and play. So we're gonna double click on that. And so do you see it defaults to frame five? And it says replace the number five in the code below with the frame you want it to go to. So it actually gives you instructions 
to where to go in the code in order to tell the thing to do what you go to and play. If you ever, the olden days, I used to write games in my Commodore 64. <laughs> you know what it is? All the computer? And I had to write all of this code to make my games, right? It was all manual coding. So I would make golf games, I would write down, and I'd have to go into each of the play commands and change the play commands to what I want it to be. So you see, that needs to be a two in order to get it to go to and play frame number two. Yeah, so when it unfreezes or you cancel it, for the sake of it, save it and drag it to the desktop just so that you're not running off the thumb drive. It depends on a lot of factors, but all right. So now once we make that change, I'm actually gonna close the action windows because I can always go to window actions and reopen it up. And I'm gonna close the code snippets for a second too, just so that you can see where we're at, right? So let's save it. I haven't saved this yet. That's naughty on my part because if you know the power went out, I would be crying right now. So I'm going to name it lecture to underscore final, just so that I have the thing. Best practice. You should save this thing every once in a while. It's not the machine, it's, it's the thumb drive. Yeah, it's running everything off. If that's 256 or 128 or whatever size that thing is, it's using it as a hard drive, basically an external hard drive. So if it was like a terabyte external drive, it would run a little bit quicker than a thumb drive that's 64 or 128 or whatever the size of that thing is. So you see, it is frozen because of the stop command with just the play button because the initial action I applied was stop here, stop at this frame and I had nothing selected. So if I move my mouse down, you'll notice that my hand, this turns into a hand, which is the universal symbol for this thing is a button. I click on it, she moves, it goes back to play. So where does it go to? To have it go back to that. Where on the timeline does this thing go to after we apply the go to and play? So it goes frame two to what? Or back to one. One. Very good. So I could actually add a stop command with nothing selected, right? At frame 60 and say stop and add a replay button here that would take me back to the beginning of this thing. But because it went back to play, I'm fine with it. Actually, the sample I gave you, I put a replay button down here. I stopped it at frame one and I stopped it at frame 60. And I put a second button that said, click to go to. And okay, so I did click to go to. Where did I click and go to my replay button so that you didn't see the play button? Two, two. very good. So the replay button said, go to and play frame two, and you never saw play again because you've already played it the first time. Yeah, all right. Now, so I'm gonna close that. One last little thing, because now we've seen some basic action scripting attached to our symbols to control behaviors in the movie. But one thing we didn't see was that a button symbol looks different than a movie clip symbol when we go inside of the symbol itself, right? When we double clicked on the movie clip, we saw a timeline. When we double click on the play button, we see the four states of a button, which is what we call the four states of the button. Up, over, down, hit. So up is what it looks like when you don't move, when your mouse is nowhere near the button. Over is what it looks like when your mouse goes over the button. What normally happens when your mouse goes over a button? Or changes color or something, right? So up, 
It's what it is to your mouse interacts with it. Over what it looks like when your mouse mouses over it. Down is what it looks like when you click on the button. And hit is what it looks like after you click the button one time to tell you you were already there. So. Okay. Awesome. Okay. I'll look at it in a second. Let's just add the last stage. All right. So the very last aspect is we need to add keyframes to each one of the states. Now, I like to add a keyframe to over, which is the color it would be when your mouse moves over it. And whatever the over color is, I like to make it the down color. So I'm going to add a keyframe to over. Right click, add a keyframe. And then I'm going to change the color to black. So if I move my playhead, it's white to black, white to black. So all I did was add a keyframe, select the text, and change the color over here. So when I click on play over here on fill, you should change that to black. And I like to have the down be the same color as the over. So it shouldn't really change when you click on the button. So I'm going to insert a keyframe. And you'll notice white, black, black. And then last but not least is the color the button is once you clicked it one time. Now you'll notice on the web, text is normally blue. And after you visited that link, it changes to pink or purple. So for us, we need the hit color to be a different color just so that we know that we visited the link. But honestly, if we had a replay button, you would never see the play button again. So you wouldn't know you visited it, but we did it where you would see it. So I'm gonna insert a keyframe and I'm gonna make it like a purple. Something you can tell. So it is white, black, purple. So that just means that the last state is when the button has been visited. So once I added the states to the button, I just double clicked outside the movie and it brought me back to scene number one, or you can click on the scene number one tab. And then don't do your control movie because it'll run off your thumb drive, but just see what happens. So if you do test movie in animate, you're gonna notice the button changes color. So you see how it changes color, that's the interaction, that's the over and down. I click on it, it runs the movie and it goes back. Now, the hit would be purple if this thing was published live because it would show it was visited the second time I mouse over it. That looks pretty good. All right, last step, and then I'm going to wrap up our thing we have going on here, our animation. We need to add the sound. We need to add the sound because we need waves or something happening in our movie. Now, for me, I like the action layer to be the top layer, which you can see right there. And I like the sound layer to be the bottom layer. The reason I like the sound layer to be the bottom layer because in sound production software, traditionally the video is above the audio. It's just the nature of the beast. Premiere does it that way too. So we need to insert a new layer and move that layer to the bottom. So I'm gonna insert a layer and move the layer to the bottom. So I click the plus symbol, which gave me layer five, and then I click and drag. So you see how I can drag the layer? I just dragged it to the bottom. Now, the wave file is what we're going to insert. So make sure you're on playhead one on layer number five, which is going to be our sound layer. And we can do file, import to stage, and pick the wave file. I always do wave files. And you're going to notice that the line fills 
with the sound. Now we have the sound turned down because it's gonna be crashing waves the entire time the animation's happening, but these are the waves of the audio clip. Now, if I was doing this for a client, I would have brought this sound into Premiere and cut it to two seconds. So at the end of the two seconds, the sound would end. And then when I replayed the movie, the sound would play again. This sound clip is longer than two seconds. So it's actually gonna to continue to make noise even when the playhead goes back to play. Cause I think the sound is like 12 seconds or something like that. It's longer than two seconds. So now I'm just gonna turn it up just ever so slightly. I don't wanna make it too loud. I would go and put the sound. See, it's finally ending, but it was like 10 or 12 seconds. It should end at the end of two seconds so that when I re-click the play, it replays again. So now when I click, it should replay again instead of having that elongated delay. So you can import static images, you can import vector graphics, and you can import sound. And you can also import video into a layer and the layer becomes a keyframe. So you can have video embedded in your animation, MP4 video embedded with its own play commands inside of the movie that has its own animation. The difference is you need to make sure that you have visible frames for the length of the time that you want the video to run. What I do is I put a stop command at frame one and I introduce the videos where along the timeline I want. And I put stop command at the frame that the video is imported into. So you can click it, play the video. And then when you're done, you can click the button to move to the next. So when I do animations that are wireframes, I do buttons that control timelines and along the timeline are different keyframes with different videos. So that's a big leap from the baby steps here. I just wanted to open up the eyes to the fact that if you can import it and you can control the motion of the movie, you can do all kinds of stuff. So let's save it. I'm going to pop over. I think for some reason I can stay in the same screen. I don't know why it's like. Oh, that's okay. Just let go. No, it's changed. I've got to cancel it. Oh, because you did the preview sound inside the preview window. That's okay. Just give it a second. Next time we definitely need that. Anything. I'll just keep it. All right, gang, I'm going to end the recording. Um, I'm going to stay online. I'm just going to cut the projector real quick to see if we have any questions um, as we're kind of popping in. So that's our lecture for this week. I'm going to post the lecture in the announcement section, and we're going to continue with our uh, micro skills, uh, our chapter projects. Uh, and hopefully, if you have any questions during the week, just make sure that you shoot me a chat. I'm going to go ahead and mute real quick.